Good morning. Can y'all hear me? Morning. Morning. We good? All right. Good morning. I, um, it's a privilege to be here with y'all this morning. Um, I got to say right off the bat, um, I've never clapped so much in a Presbyterian church. So y'all got a good thing going here. Um, I mean that. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I haven't I haven't sung a song by William Murphy in like five or six years, so, oh man. Um, but yeah, it's a privilege to be with y'all this morning. Uh, thank you, JP, for uh, asking me to come and to share and to kick off the series, well, the second part of the series on uh, who is our God, talking about God the Son this morning. So if you would, uh, turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, and that's the Gospel of John, and we're going to be in the very first chapter and we're going to read the first 14 verses, um, but full disclosure, we're going to spend most of our time right there in those first few verses and then in the last verse, verse 14. And so while you're turning there, I just kind of want to go ahead and get you situated. If you've never been in the Gospel of John, you're going to see something right at the beginning. He's going to talk about um, this person he calls the Word. And he just talks about the word as if you already know what he's talking about. So if you haven't actually spent much time in the Gospel of John, it could be kind of confusing. So I just want to go ahead and spoil it for you. When John talks about the word, he doesn't really mention who he's talking about until verse 14 where he says the word becomes flesh. And so you see that he's actually equating the word with the Son, the Son of God, who we know to be as Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. So keep that in mind as we are reading these first uh, 14 verses. And if you wonder, well, why in the world would John use the term word? Why does he call Jesus the word? And theologians have their own comments about this, but I think the, the biggest thing to, to pick up from that term, that, that word, logos, word there, is when you speak to a person, right, or when a person talks to you, what's the best way to kind of know what's on that person's mind, right? If you really want to know a person's mind and heart, you listen to what they say, right? If you want to know what a person really, what's going on deep down in their heart, it comes out, it's revealed to you uh, by your words. And I think John maybe is picking up on that in the sense that he's saying Jesus is the perfect revelation of who God is, that when you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. And so keep that in mind. So the connection is word, son, Jesus, okay? So John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. And before we hear from God's word, let me pray for us. Our God, we praise you and thank you for your holy, uh, inspired, and inerrant word. Lord, we ask now that you would open the eyes of our hearts that we might behold wondrous things out of your law, namely that we might behold your wonderful Son, the only begotten from you, from the Father, full of grace and truth. So would you do this, Lord, and move our hearts to worship him, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, this is God's word. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, John the Baptist that is, and he came as a witness, to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, 
but God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, may God bless the reading and the hearing of His Word. So this morning I've been tasked to kick off this series on uh, that you guys have been going through on who is our God. And JP said uh, that you guys spent the month of March on God the Father, and so I'm tasked this morning with preaching on God the Son. And so before we dive in, I just want to take a moment to kind of situate us a little bit, situate our approach, because the task that I've been assigned this morning is no ordinary task. It is no task to be carelessly approached, and it is not one that should be taken lightly. For what we are about to encounter this morning, or rather who we are about to encounter this morning, is none other than the eternal Son of the living God. The one who we as Christians, as God's people, have come to know as the divine Son, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. And so if I can speak, perhaps metaphorically this morning, as we approach this passage, y'all, we stand on holy ground. You remember when the Lord, the, when the Lord first revealed himself to Moses, right, at, at Mount Horeb, through the burning bush, he calls out to him, He says, Moses, Moses, Moses says, here am I. And what does he say? He says, take off your sandals. Take the sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And so my brothers and sisters, as we approach this text this morning, let us do so with the same reverence and awe that Moses did when he approached God, the burning bush. For this morning, we are introduced not to an abstract philosophical concept, not to a mere idea, not even first and foremost to theological truth, but we are being introduced to a person. We are being introduced to the divine Son. And so when the Apostle John, who wrote this gospel in the latter part of the first century as an eyewitness of Jesus, one of the original 12 apostles, disciples, he is introducing us to a person. And if I could borrow the language from The series title, Pulling Back the Curtain, John is, as it were, pulling back the curtain this morning to reveal to us the life of Jesus before he came into the world. And in doing so, he's kind of taken us by the hand and he's showing us the inner life of God before the creation of all things. He's given us a a VIP, a behind the stage pass. He's he's taken us into the inner life of the Trinity. That's his purpose. That's the purpose of his introduction to reveal Jesus as the pre-existent, eternal, fully divine Word. The only begotten Son of the Father, he says, full of grace and truth. And so following after John this morning, it's my hope That as we hear the word, that we come to a better understanding of who God is in the person of the Son, and that we all would be moved to worship Him together with the Father and the Spirit as our glorious and great and majestic triune God. Amen? Now, normally, I like to set up my sermons all all night uh, nice and neat with, you know, I got the main point, and I've got three little nice sub points holding it up, but... Due to the nature of the task, I kind of had to switch things up, and uh, so this is new for me. So what we're going to do this morning, instead of doing that, we are going to ask a guiding question of the text that I think John would have to answer. And the question that we're going to ask this morning is simply, who is the Son? Okay, who is the Son? And I think John gives us at least three answers to that this morning. Three things. He says he was God, he was with God, and he became flesh. He was God, he was with God, and he became flesh. So let's look there at the first one this morning. Who is the Son? John says 
He is God. Look there at verses 1 and 2. What does he say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 1. In the beginning, John says, was the Word. Now pause there and think about that for a moment. Because I think that statement already speaks to the full divinity of who Jesus is. The full divinity of the Son. And so if I can explain, you're probably thinking, okay, what do you, what do you mean by that preacher? Let me ask you, what's, what's a famous book in the Bible that you know that begins with the words, in the beginning? Genesis, right? And Genesis starts by saying, in the beginning what? Or who? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Now notice, John is putting the word in the exact same spot that Moses, the writer of Genesis, places God. And if you're a first century Jewish believer, and many scholars think that this is exactly the primary audience to who John would have been writing, there wouldn't have been much doubt as to what John was intending to do here. You would be able to tell immediately from the beginning that John is equating the Word with God. When Genesis says, in the beginning, God, it's intending to establish his eternality. That as God, there is nothing that comes before him. He's always been there since the beginning of all things. He created all things. And John is saying in the same way when John says here, in the beginning was the word, he's telling us of the eternality of the word, that there was nothing that came before him. He's always been there since the beginning, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever he had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting. He is God. Son is God. And if that wasn't clear enough, John, he moves on, right? He says, okay. He keeps going, and then he makes a direct statement at the end of verse 1. What does he say? And the Word was God. Straight out, directly, just says it. Just in case there was any doubt from what he was saying. He's saying that the Word, that the Son... God the Son, he says, is fully God. He's not partially God. He's not halfway God. He's not a demigod. He's not, you know, part God, but maybe part something else. No, he's fully divine. The old church used to say he was very God, a very God. But then, it's the first two verses, right? You're like, man, okay, John, I think, all right, I'm tracking with you. Jesus is the Son, right? John's like, maybe that's not enough. If I'm not making myself clear, let's go to verse 3. So he says, what? Look there, he says, all things were made through him. All things were made through him. And then what does he say? And it kind of can seem a little redundant, right? Like John is just repeating himself. But then after he says that, he says, and without him was what? Without him was not anything made that was made. And you're like, John... Are you, really? John's like, yeah. So it's not just that all things were made through him, but he's saying, look, think of anything that you can think of that's been made. He made it. <laughs> it was made through him. So in John's head, he's saying there's, there's, two, there's two categories of being in this universe. There's the creator, and then there's creatures. You either stand on one side or the other side, and John is saying the word The divine Son is the creator of all things. He's not a creature, but rather it's through him that all creatures have been made. And then he goes on in verse 4, he says, In him was life. I would even think that's proving his divinity, his divinity, for we know that God is the source of all life, both physical life and spiritual life. And he's saying, in him was life. And then, and we don't really have too much time to deal with these verses, but verses 5 through 9, we get introduced to John the Baptist, right? The witness. He's pointing to Christ. He's pointing to the Son. And I think, y'all, even in that, and when you stop and think about it, it's proof of his divinity. And you're like, okay, what do you mean? 
So John the Baptist, right in the other Gospels, he comes and he takes upon himself kind of like the spirit of Elijah, right? That's what they say. And even more so, he comes fulfilling the prophecy of the one, the messenger, saying, the, the voice crying in the wilderness, right? Saying, prepare the way of the Lord. And if you think about that verse that they use to apply to John, in the Old Testament context, when it says, prepare the way for the Lord, y'all do know that's the Lord in all caps, right? As in Yahweh. And so when John comes and he bears witness to Jesus, he's using this and saying, I'm preparing the way for the Lord. In other words, he's saying, I'm preparing for Yahweh. Jesus. He's, he's making the equation that in the same way that the messenger prepared for Yahweh, he's preparing the way for Jesus. He's saying, Jesus is Yahweh. Which, if you're, an, if you're a first century Jew, you are being completely blown away right now with the audacity to say that this man was God, was Yahweh. He shared in the divine name. And I know you're probably thinking, okay, this is obvious to us, preacher. We know Jesus is God. And if you grew up in a, in a in a church background, or if you, if you grew up in a, in a Christian household, maybe you know you knew from the beginning, yeah, I know Jesus was God. But I want you to know and to never forget, my brothers and sisters, that it's extremely important that we believe the Son is fully God, that Jesus is God. Because you might not realize this, there are many who still think Jesus was just a man. Maybe a prophet. Maybe, you know, he was a morally good man, they say. He, maybe they would even say that he was the perfect man, the perfect teacher. And yet they wouldn't confess that he's God. They're like, no, 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 that's, that's a little too far. We don't, we don't quite believe that. We can't really believe that a man was God. But my brothers and sisters, if Jesus was not fully God, if he was not fully divine, if the Son was not truly the eternal and divine Word, then guess what? He cannot be our Savior. If he was just a good moral teacher, then he can't pay the full price that our sins deserve. If he was just a, a perfect man even, and he was perfect, but if that's all he was, and even just the perfect man wouldn't be able to bear the full weight of God's wrath for all the sins of God's people. But because the Word was God, John says, because the Son was and fully God, He could sustain the full weight of God's wrath for all of God's people. Because He was fully God, it means that the sacrifice that He made on the cross was of infinite value and worth. Because his person as the eternal son was an infinitely worthy person. And as the infinitely worthy son, y'all, let's not rob him of the glory that's due to his name, but let us worship him together with the host of heaven crying out, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. John says, who is the Son? He was God. But if you're looking carefully there, if you look at the first verse again, and I told you we're going to spend the bulk of our time here. But if you're looking, if you're reading that, that introduction from John carefully, you'll notice that that's not all that John says of the Word, does he? In fact, he says very plainly, twice even in the first two verses, another little phrase that could be kind of confusing, right? What is it? Look at it. Verse 1, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was what? Was with God. And then you go to verse 2, and he's like, now I'm going to emphasize it again. He says what? He was in the beginning, what? With God. And now you're probably wondering, okay, I thought I was tracking with John. I thought I was tracking with him. He's, he said he's fully God, right? But now, you're probably wondering, what does that mean? How can the Son, how can the Word both be God 
and yet be with God. You, you ever stop to think about that? How can the word be God and yet be with God? And my brothers and sisters from here, it's from here along with the rest of the testimony of all of Scripture that we as the church come to confess that glorious, mysterious doctrine that we just sang about, the doctrine of the Trinity. That the one God we worship exists eternally in three persons as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If I could borrow the words of maybe one contemporary theologian, he says, there's only one God, but there's more than one who is the one God. And so, there really is no other way to explain what John is saying in this text, y'all, to do justice to this text than to say when John says the Word was with God, he's communicating that, the, that God the Son was with God the Father. That's the best way. That's the only way that you can explain what John is trying to say here. So when he uses the phrase, the Word was with God, he's trying to indicate here that though the Son is truly God, he is nevertheless distinct from the Father. And I know we're going there this morning. This is, I wouldn't go there if John didn't go there, but John's going there, so we got to go there. There's a one re- one uh, old theologian, he says it this way. He says, the mode of expression, namely that the Word was with God. Man, I think that's a biting fly. But the mode of expression, namely that the Word was with God, is attributing to the Son, he says, a distinct personality from the Father. And y'all, come on, hang in there with me. We going. In other words, John wants us to see that though the Father is God, and though the Son is equally God, the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. And the same goes for the Holy Spirit. You see, it's not, make it it a little bit more practical, it's not like there was the Father in the Old Testament, and then the New Testament came, and then he just kind of, whoop, he He just switched forms and turned into the Son. And then after Pentecost, or at Pentecost, boop, he turns into the Spirit. No, 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 no. It's not three different appearances of God, John says, but each of these persons exist alongside one another, to use John's word, with one another from all eternity, each as the one God. Not three different gods, not three different manifestations of God, but one God and three persons. And I know, I know, this is, you know, might say like this is heady theology stuff, but actually this is extremely practical, okay? In our denomination, our uh, part of the PCA, so let's represent a little bit, our, our denomination's catechism puts it this way, it says, There are three persons in the Godhead, in the one being of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory. And I know all of this might seem a little confusing. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around this and to understand it. Y'all, I would try to use some analogies. I try to use the water. I try to use the sun. I try to use all those analogies, but honestly, they just break down. And they actually could convey something that the Bible isn't teaching if you aren't careful. And so, even though we might not be able to fully understand it and comprehend it or wrap our minds around it, y'all, this is what we believe, not because we're making this up, but because this is what God has revealed to us about himself in his word. And honestly, I don't know if you ever thought about it this way, but this is what makes Christianity unique. Out of every other religion, what other religion do you know confesses a three-person God? You ever thought about that? Only Christianity says there's one God that exists in three persons. No other 
religion confesses a triune God, and honestly, this is one of the many reasons why I'm still convinced of the truth of God's word. Nobody in their right mind, if they were just making up a religion, would be like, you know what, I'm going to go here and I'm going to say this is one God, but then I'm going to say the word was with God, the word was God. Nobody would think of that. And God says, that's why I'm revealing myself to you. He's revealed himself to us. He has, by himself, through his apostles and prophets, pulled back the curtain to show us who he is in his innermost being. He's shown us the Father who's unbegotten, the Son who is begotten, the Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son. And at some point, y'all, you just get to the point where words fail and you can't help but just give worship and praise to this glorious God who exists in three persons. And you're probably still thinking now, okay, yeah, I get that, but why does the distinction matter for John? Why does it matter that the Word was God but also he was with God. Why does that matter? Why does it matter that the Son was with the Father from all eternity? Why does that matter? Why does John go at length to tell us this? If it's true that Jesus was with the Father from all eternity, as John tells us in verses 1 and 2, then it means at least a few things. I think first, it means this that you can trust every single thing that Jesus tells us about the Heavenly Father. Every single thing he says. When you're reading the Gospels, when you're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, even when you're reading the, Old, uh, the New Testament epistles, who are Jesus' apostles sent and commissioned by him, you can trust every single thing that they are telling you about our Heavenly Father. Why? Because Jesus says, I've been with them. I've been with him. I use like a, use an example here. I can use an example here. I don't think I'll get into any trouble. But say you got, you want to, there's a guy named Bill, okay? Sorry, is anybody in here named Bill? No Bills? All right, good. So say there's a guy named Bill, right? And uh, you want to get to know who Bill is. And so Bill's got two friends. He's got Angela, who's been with him for, for two years, been his friend for about two years. And then you got Nathan, who's been Bill's friend for 25 years. Now, there could be some, there could be something crazy going on where this, is, this might not work. But typically speaking, who are you going to trust to be able to tell you more about who Bill is? Angela, who's been with Bill for two years, or Nathan, who's been with Bill for 25 years? Nathan, right? You're going to be like, he spent time with Bill. He's been rocking with Bill for a long, long, long time. So when Jesus comes as the Word who was with God from all eternity, who do you think could best tell you who God is than Jesus? Nobody. Everything that Jesus tells us about God the Father, we can trust. Who else could better tell you about the Father than the one who's been with Him from all eternity? eternity. But not only that, I also think John goes at length to make this known to us, and this point might rub you the wrong way a little bit, but it also means God didn't really need us, did he? He didn't really need us, did he? It's not like before he created the world that, you know, he was lonely, just sitting there twiddling his fingers, and he's just like, man, I'm so bored. And lonely out here by myself. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna create. I'm gonna create creatures and I'm gonna create people so that I can love on them and they can love me back and I can have this, this great relationship. It's like, nope, that's not it. For when John says the word was with God, the Son was with the Father, he's saying that from all eternity they have existed in a perfect relationship together. That before he even created, before the foundation of the world, the father was delighting in, the, in his son, and the son was delighting in his father. They were having the time of their lives. They were delighting in one another, in the bond and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit before anything was created. 
And I know it can sound harsh to say that God doesn't need us, but I want to flip that a little bit and say, but doesn't it make redemption all the more unbelievable? That the God who doesn't need us needs nothing. He doesn't need us to fill any void in himself. Nevertheless, wanted us so much wanted to bring us into fellowship and to a relationship with himself so much that he would send that only begotten son who was with him before the world began. And not only does he just invite us into that relationship, but John will tell us later on in his gospel that he actually does bring us into fellowship with him by his finished work on the cross. And I think this is just a simple, another application of this, y'all. That when Jesus came to redeem us, it wasn't just to cleanse us of our sins and just to, to make us, to give us his righteousness. That was true. He did do that. But he did that in order to invite us that we might come back into that eternal fellowship that he has had with us, that he has had with his Father, excuse me, since before the foundation of the world. That salvation, y'all, isn't just God letting us off the hook because of what Jesus has done, but it's him inviting us into the very fellowship of the Godhead. That he is inviting us to have a relationship with the triune God, to experience that same complete joy and satisfaction that they've had with one another as the one God since before the creation of all things. The Son came, y'all. The Word became flesh. The Word was with God and was God so that we could also become children of His heavenly Father. And if I could use John's words in verse 13, children who were born, y'all, not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man, but of God. And so I'm mentioning Jesus is coming to redeem us. I think it's fitting now that we, we switch gears and we go to the, the last point here. So John, the Apostle John has said that the Word was God. He said that the Word was with God. And then jump down there with me to verse 14 and what does he say? And the Word, what? Became flesh. It says, the Word was God, the Word was with God, the Word became flesh. And I promise this is my last point, I'm done. But y'all, I think it's very, it's very easy for us to kind of, I think, miss the, the weight of what John is saying here. The weight of these words. After he told us that the Son is God, and that he was with the Father from all eternity, he says something, y'all, that would have been absolutely unthinkable. And I still think it's absolutely unthinkable today, which is why many people might not believe it. And what's that? What is he saying? John is saying that the eternal Son became flesh and dwelt among us. That God became a man. God became a man. He tells us that the Son, through whom all things were created, himself became a part of his own creation. That old uh, North African bishop of the early church, Augustine, he said it this way. He says, man's maker became man. Now make no mistake, when John says the word became flesh, he intends to communicate nothing less that the son, the divine son, took to himself a fully human nature. He had a human body. You could touch him. You could feel him. He had a human soul. He had emotions and feelings. He had a, a human mind and, and a human will. In the same way that he was fully God and remained fully God, he now 
live as fully man. And you thought that we talked about the word was with God. You thought that was confusing. You thought that was complicated. Now we're dealing with something else. Now we're dealing with, so you're telling me the man, or you're telling me the eternal divine son who was God and was with God is now also living as a man? Y'all, oh, the wonder and the mystery of the incarnation of the Son of God. Oh, to think that the Word who was God and who was with God became flesh and dwelt among us. And y'all, I don't know if you caught on, but he says the word, you see the word dwelt there in verse 14? Now, in the, in the original, that word actually kind of conveys something like the notion of a tabernacle. Y'all remember the Old Testament tabernacle? Maybe if you don't, it's uh, in the Old Testament when the, the children of Israel were in the wilderness trying to make it into the promised land, but God was leading them there uh, through Moses. And he had them set up like a little tent almost, like a little dwelling place, a tabernacle. And that would be the place where God would come and he would make his presence especially known with his people. And as even you can see the glory, they say, shining from that tabernacle. And it's like John is remembering that. And so when he uses that word dwell, it's like he's saying, that's what the tabernacle actually was pointing us toward. It was pointing toward the day when God himself would truly make his home with us as a man in the person of the Son, in order that through his life, his death, and resurrection, we might be saved. In the same way that the tabernacle radiated and gave off the glory of God, Jesus as the divine Son, the eternal Word, radiated God's glory. John says, and what? We've seen his glory. Glory is what? Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. When you saw Jesus, there's a sense in which you looked at Jesus and it's like, man, it's not too much about this guy. But there's another sense in which you look at Jesus and you see God. What does he tell? Uh, I think it's Philip. If you've seen me, what? You've seen the Father. It says, we've seen his glory, glories of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Y'all, what a combination, right? Full of grace and full of truth. Something that our culture today kind of probably wouldn't put together, would we? We kind of put those opposite. We say, man, if you tell the truth, really, you know, if you're all about telling the truth, you're probably like, you're not really that gracious. Or if you're going to be gracious, that means you kind of got to pull back and don't really tell the truth. You know, you've got to be gracious to the person. And, and here, John says, actually, when you look at Jesus, they are in perfect harmony. He's full of grace and he's full of truth. Indeed, he himself is the truth. He tells us the truth about God and about ourselves, how we are sinners, how we are under God's wrath and condemnation. And then yet he turns around and says, and I came to give you grace. This is why he came. So that in him and through him, you and I, as John would say later on in this same chapter, would receive grace upon grace. So I'm wrapping up, but um, before I come to a close, or as I come to a close, I want to ask just one simple question. One simple question. We've heard of the Word, the glorious, divine Son, the eternal word. We've heard of him. You've heard that he was God. You've heard that he's with God. Have you received him? Have you believed in his name? Have you believed in the only begotten Son of God? God the Son, the eternal Word made flesh for us 
and our salvation. Because you do know everybody didn't receive him, right? In fact, many rejected him. Think about it, isn't it? It's almost inconceivable, right? That the glorious son was rejected. And John says, and it's even by those who should have known him. His own people, Israel, what does the verse say in um, verses 10 through 11? It's the ironic thing. He says, John says he was in the world. The world was made through him. He made it. And yet because of sin, the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But John says that's not the whole story, though. Because he says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, y'all, he gave the right to become children of God. Is that you this morning? Have you received him? Have you come to know the only begotten Son from the Father, the one full of grace and truth, the one who was God, who was with God, and who became flesh. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now humbled at how you have revealed yourself and your Son to us. Lord, I pray that you would keep us in awe of the Son as the only begotten one from you. I pray, Lord, that if we do not know you, that you would bring us to know you through him, the one who was with you from the beginning. And, Lord, would you impress it upon our hearts, this truth, Lord, that everything he says about you, we can trust. Because he alone has been with you since before the foundation of the world, together with the Spirit. And so we praise you now. We thank you, lift you up, and ask that you would be with us. For us, in Christ's name we pray. Amen.